morning, guys. Uh, it is great to be with you, kind of. And uh, yeah, it is uh, definitely still missing you tremendously, but I'm so thankful uh, for the unity that we share in Jesus that's not dependent upon just our mere physical presence. Uh, but man, it is May, and I am just longing for the day that we can be back together again. Um, man, if you have a Bible, uh, if you could open it up to Psalm 43, and 42 is where we're going to be at this morning. I'm going to read this. And I'm going to pray for us as we go into our time in God's Word. It says in Psalm 42, verse 1, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me continually, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with a throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me continually, Where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Let's pray. Oh God, we come before you, many of us with heavy hearts, uh, with deep sadness and sorrow, with many cares. And we pray, God, that you would speak a word to us that would lift our burdens and set us free today. God, that we really would cast our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us, that you see us in our current state, and that you are at work. So God, we do pray that you would fill us up with hope, that you would give us perspective in this time, and more than anything, God, that you would breathe on us, that you would speak to us so clearly. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, just look at the uh, intro to the psalm. Just notice a couple things here. Uh, it says, to the choir master, a maskil, uh, which is a word that I'm sure you definitely used this week many times, but um, uh, no, really, it's, it's a hard word to translate, really. It's, it's a word that refers to making or singing wisdom, to the making or singing of wisdom. In other words, this is a song of instruction. It's, it's teaching us something. Well, what is it teaching us? Well, notice the structure of the psalm. It's very clear, isn't it? Verse 1 through 5 you see a, a pattern, and then in verses 6 through 7, another one, and then verses 1 through 5. And every single time uh, we see this refrain that it ends with, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Right? It, it's teaching us what to do with our sorrow. That's what this psalm is teaching us. I, I, I wonder this morning even if you've ever been in a place where it seemed... It seemed that God was missing or maybe even absent in your life. And you might even confess in those kinds of moments, I'm not doubting God, but he feels distant. I mean, he, he used to be such a clear 
reality in my life, but now my life feels like my soul is in a place of drought, in a place of famine. I actually wonder what you would say to a friend this morning, maybe a Christian friend, obviously, that would say to you the same thing today. God feels distant. What would you say to somebody like them? Would your first instinct be to assume that something is wrong with them or something has gone wrong with their life? What would you, what would you do? What would you say to a person like that? See, see, when something isn't as it ought to be, our instinct is to think that we can just toss someone a podcast maybe a book, an encouragement, or maybe even a cup of coffee, and that'll just fix their troubles. Right? That, that's often what we think. And if their troubles don't go away, or if our troubles don't go away, we might assume something isn't right in that person's life. That's our assumption. But guys, deep sorrow, depression even, hits all of us. None of us are immune to the pain and sorrow of this life. Even people who have their words end up as Holy Scripture aren't immune. And this is exactly where the psalmist finds himself this morning. The pattern follows uh, very clearly what we see here in the psalmist. First of all, we see that he is, he's being very real about his current situation. Then we often see him fighting for what's true and thirdly, hoping in God, telling himself to hope in God. He's consistently being real, fighting, hoping, real, fighting, hoping, real, fighting, and hoping. And so in light of this, let's look at these three things. First, that he's real about where he's at. Secondly, that he's fighting for what's true. And third, that he's hopeful about the process. And it's my prayer that as we look at how this psalmist battles his sorrow, that you and I would find tremendous comfort and hope and direction as well. So first, he's real about where he's at. Let's just look at the first three verses again, although we see this in verse 6, 7, and verses 1 through 2 of chapter 43. It says, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me continually, Where is your God? This is yet another reason why I love the Bible, because it shows us that we don't have to fake it till we make it. That's what it shows us. This psalmist is depressed, okay? It's very clear. He's experiencing what St. John of the Cross called the dark night of the soul. Uh, He says, I am like a deer. I, I thirst after God, but I cannot find water, right? It's a place of desperation. It says he's panting, which is a state of exhaustion. And just think about it. This is a really famous verse. I grew up singing a song that I really love called As the Deer. But man, if this psalmist has seen what we've done with this psalm, man, he would be uh, embarrassed or something. I mean, because often we, we read these verses and we picture a really healthy, happy deer on a sunny day just lapping up some water near the stream. And that's not at all what this psalmist is depicting to us. It shouldn't be a really healthy, happy deer that we're envisioning. This is, this should be an image of of a dead deer, basically. Someone who's very malnourished and, and panting. That's exactly the imagery that we should be having in our minds. See, this psalmist, notice though, doesn't seem to believe that he has this sin in his life that he needs to confess. He doesn't confess any sin in either of these psalms. And, and we need to know this, that sin can lead to sadness as a believer. Sin does lead to sadness as a believer. And and the reality is is that if that's true, if we know there's sin in our life and that sin is birthing sadness, then we need to go to God and confess that sin and ask Him to forgive us and to make us right with Him, right? But here, here, His sorrow isn't because of His sin, not at all. God seems absent from His life and He's miserable. And to make matters worse, there aren't those around him. There are those people that are around him, right, who are mocking him and saying to him, where is your God? Where is your God? You know, it feels natural when we walk through valleys of sorrow that we wonder where God is. It's a very natural thing. And there are others who ask us the same sort of thing. Where is your God? We tend to equate the presence of God with feasting, not famine. That's, that's what we think. 
So he's very real here in these first few verses, but then go to verse 7. He's experiencing, he says, uh, what he's experiencing is kind of like being pounded by the waves of a waterfall or at minimum being pounded by ocean waves or roaring rapids, right? The water, he says, is going over me. It's billowing over me. It's an image of desperation, of, of not feeling secure, of not feeling safe at all. It's an image of disorientation and trying just to, to catch our breath. Uh, one thing that I really enjoy doing whenever I get the chance is to go uh, whitewater rafting. It's just a blast. But I remember one time we went and we we're trying to um, go around this, this, this turn and our raft got pinned up against a really large rock and the raft began to fill with water and it flipped us over. And man, all within a second, you're, you, a lot of thoughts are going through your head. If you're like, I can get pinned up against this rock. I hope that I come out alive. You know, you just get submerged. You have no way of knowing which way is up, which way is down. You can't see anything. You're in these roaring rapids and you just kind of have to hold on, try to put your feet downstream, catch a few breaths of air from time to time and hope that the water calms down and that you can get to the side once again. All right? It's, it's a place of disorientation and, and, um, and definitely a place of desperation. But that's the same exact thing that we're seeing here in this psalm. He is panting for water, yet he has access to a lot of water. But this isn't drinking water. This is scary water. This is scary water. Then you look further down in this poetic prayer in verse 9. He's crying out to God, and he says he feels forgotten by God, meaning at one point he felt the smile of God. He heard the voice of God. He witnessed the power of God, and yet now it seems from his perspective that if you asked God about him, he would think that God was going to say, oh yeah, I forgot about that guy. That's how he feels. And in verse 2 of chapter 43, he says he feels rejected by God, not warmly received by God, but turned away. See, I just, I just wonder, do you resonate at all with this psalmist? Maybe sometime in your past, maybe Maybe you will someday, but, but really today, do you, do you resonate at all? Have you known deep sorrow? Or have you known pain, numbness, even depression? Have you known this? Let's be really honest with you. I've, I've known this area fairly well in my life. About five years ago, I was finally able to admit that I struggle with depression at times. And it was a very difficult thing for me to come to grips with. I would go into these really dark places where life just had no flavor. I felt very numb, very disinterested in everything, very upset at myself even for feeling this way. I mean, I would, I would preach sermons and then we'd have nights where we'd baptize all these people and I would go home and I would just feel so down, just the, the crushing weight of life. And I was so frustrated. I would think, man, I just can't I can't do this anymore. I feel terrible. I can't preach. I can't lead. I feel dumb about the way that I'm thinking. I mean, I think, come on, you are a pastor even. Just get over it. But then when I looked at the scriptures, you guys, I realized that I, I was not alone. Let me just consider Moses in Numbers chapter 11. He wept before God at the burden of leading God's people, and he said, God, kill me. Naomi had a troubled history. She was ripped from her family at a young age. She married this really big loser of a husband, had these two sons, both miserable and useless. Num one's name was actually useless. She said her life was worth nothing and, quote, things are far more bitter for me than you because God has raised his fist at me. You see people like Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 who constantly is weeping. She wouldn't even eat. She's in that dark of a place. Over the reality, she went bitterly that she could not have kids. David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, you know David, the guy who actually killed a giant, he's a giant killer. I don't know about you, but I've never killed a giant. You've never killed a giant, I imagine, right? Video games don't count, okay? But I mean, just think about David and all the Psalms that he wrote about his despair. Think of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 that we looked at this spring. When he sees the glory of God on Mount Carmel, he goes to the mountain and says, God, take my life. Consider Job, the entire book. Consider Jonah chapter 2 when he's uh, submerging in the water in the belly of the fish and how he's just in deep sorrow and, and wanting to die. You see Jeremiah who's called the weeping prophet, even the great Solomon. You know, the guy who had it all said, so I hated life. Forget it all. It's all worthless. You look at the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, who was so burdened beyond strength that he despaired of life itself. 
Let me just ask you, are you being honest? Are you as honest as the Bible? See, depression and generally sorrow are places that cause us to feel alone, isolated. And as we see other people projecting their happiness, it makes our sorrow feel even darker. So what do we do when we feel that gray cloud over our heads, the rain cloud that you see like in the the comics or something like that, and yet you're looking out and it seems that the sunshine is just shining on everybody else. What do we do? Well, we take our pain and we hide with it. I mean, C.S. Lewis said so much so. He said, mental pain is less dramatic than physical pain, but it's more common and also more difficult to bear. The frequent attempt to conceal mental pain increases the burden. It's easier to say my tooth is aching than to say my heart is broken. Let me ask you, when was the last time you told someone, man, God seems far away? I feel abandoned by him. The first step we take in our sorrow, even sorrow that you're going through now, is to not to merely put a smile on your face, but to open up your heart to God and to other people and to be honest with where you're at. But the second thing we see here is that he's fighting for what's true. We see this in verse 4, verses 8 through 10, verses 3 through 4. Let me just ask you this, though. When you find yourself in places like Psalm 42, Psalm 43, how do you fight? Do you even fight? Do you find yourself giving up, trying to escape, numbing yourself, working harder, staying busier? How do you fight? We should see very clearly what the psalmist is doing. He is fighting. We shouldn't just surrender to our emotions, you guys. We shouldn't just listen to our heart and say, well, that's just the way it is. No, we need to fight. That's what the psalmist does. And in his fight, he's teaching us how to fight. What does he do? Well, notice first what he does. He remembers. He remembers. In verse 4, we see this. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. That's what he says. And what he remembers is leading this procession of praise of people heading to the temple to worship God. It says a throng of people, which a throng is definitely not a word you and I use very much, I'm assuming, but it's a word that means a densely populated crowd of people. So he's remembering a time when he is leading this party of praise into the house of God. He's remembering the good times. He's isolated from that right now. In other words, what is causing his sorrow is at least at minimum his inability to be with those people praising God again. Notice just where he's at in verse 6. He says, I remember you from the land of Jordan, of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. He is hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. He's in the mountains, and he is remembering the times that he would go with that throng of people, and now he's far away from that, from that scene. We, we know, guys, this side of the cross and the empty grave of Jesus, we know that the temple that you read about in the Old Testament is not the same thing as a church building. We know that. The temple was the place where God's presence, where His Spirit dwelled. But now, because of the gospel, we are told in the New Testament that the temple of God is the people of God, that we are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God, that same Spirit now lives in us. So there is an incredible joy that you and I have as believers when we gather together as a church and we praise God together. We can resonate with this, with this kind of sorrow especially. We remember those joyful moments of gathering and praising God and encouraging one another to turn our eyes to Jesus. We might, we might not be at Mount Mazar right now, but we are not together praising God like we remember. Guys, suffering in part for the psalmist, for you and I, comes from isolation from the people of God. And what is he doing, though? He's remembering. He's not just spiraling into his situation. He's remembering. Remembering is a powerful thing. It's one of the best things that you can do when you're in a place of despair. It's to remember the times where God vividly worked in your heart, where he produced overflowing joy, when he showed you great things. We, we look back on those moments Honestly, in some of my darkest moments, this has helped me in powerful ways. When the numbness sets in, just remembering the gracious and power, uh, powerful activity of God in my life feels like a, a match is lit in a room where there is sheer darkness and no light at all. 
Right? We need people to come alongside of us and say, do you remember when this happened in your life? Do you remember when you said that? Do you remember this? Do you remember how God did this in your life and for your family or whatever it is? Right? We need this. Remembering is such a powerful way to fight. But secondly, he preaches. Verse 8, in many other spots really, but verse 8 specifically, preaches to whom? Well, he preaches to himself. As you are always, always listening to yourself. You are always doing that. There are voices in your ear all the time. You are a really, really good listener, right? Don't listen to what anybody else says, right? You are actually a really good listener. Maybe you didn't realize that, right? But you are often listening to bad perspectives, to untrue things. And so the psalmist starts talking to himself, and that's exactly what we need to start doing. Right? Notice right after he talks about drowning, he uses this poetic parallelism to communicate the moment-by-moment moment loving presence of God. He says, quote in verse 8, By day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. Do you see that? It's like he pops out of despair just for a moment as the waves are billowing over him, and he comes up and catches a breath of air, and he says, When it's day, God is commanding his steadfast love. God is commanding his love towards the psalmist. And at night, his song, that tune from his mouth, is in my ear. He, he might have lost sight of God, but he's fighting to believe that God hasn't lost sight of him. Although he ex exclaims, even at other points, that he feels rejected, that he feels forgotten by God, he fights to believe that God is still commanding his love and that God's song is still with him in the dark. God feels distant, you guys, yet he still claims God in a personal way. Notice what he's doing. Notice this. He calls God what? My rock, verse 9. Notice it. He calls God my God in chapter 43, verse 4. He's preaching to himself the character of God throughout this psalm. He's holding on solely to the character of God. He calls God the living God, verse 2. The Lord, which is the covenant name Yahweh of God for his people in verse 8. All right, he calls God my Savior, my God, verses 5, 11, and 5. He's telling himself it's God who his soul pants for. In other words, he's preaching to himself that God is his delight and the longing of his heart. He's grounding himself in the character of God, specifically even in God's providence and sovereignty. Do you notice in verse 7 how he is acknowledging that this is God's doing? He calls it what? Your waterfalls, your breakers, your waves. He's going, I don't understand, but you are allowing this for some reason. But he still understands in the very next verse you see it, that God loves him. And how in the world do you hold a verse like verse 7 and verse 8 together? How do you do that? Well, you hold it together by being a person who's not dictated by your feelings but you're dictated by the character of God. That's how you do it. See, depression and sorrow can take over your life. It, it runs over you, right? It defines you and shapes you, especially if you're a person who just sweeps it under the rug and puts a smile on your face, and at night you cry on your bed alone, but you never go to God and cry. If you do that, your sorrow shapes you. I always think back a few years ago, Eden... Um, I always remember this because it was kind of so cute, but um, she asked me at one point when she was younger, when babies grow bigger, how do they know their own name? And kids ask you the weirdest questions, and sometimes you're like, that's a really interesting question. I, don't, I had to think about it just for a second, but then you realize, well, a baby knows their own name because you call them by that name over and over and over and over and over again. They don't go and look at their birth certificate, see what their name is, and they go, oh, I guess that's my name. No, they hear their name spoken over them all the time. See, depression tells us lies. It calls you a different name. It says to you, where is your God? He has rejected you. He has forgotten you. But God, who is your hope, speaks to you a different name over and over and over and over again. He calls you my daughter. You are my son. I am your rock, your God. I am not dead. I am living. I am your Savior. Guys, don't just listen. Talk to yourself. Third, he prays. He prays. In verse 3, notice this. He talks to God. 
when you are in places of sorrow, what do you pray for? I mean, do you even pray? The psalmist prays in verse 1 of chapter 43 for God to defend him, deliver him. But then look how that plays itself out in verse 3. He says, send out your light and your truth. Let your light and truth lead me to your dwelling, back to the temple. He sees the way to freedom, the way to his heart's deepest delight, coming through God, giving him light and truth, not something else. He doesn't ask for anything else. He says, God, send your light, send your truth. Lord, that's what I need. In times of spiritual drought, guys, it can be really hard. It could be really tough to keep your Bible open, can it? The, the last thing you sometimes want to do is pray. You don't even know what you're, you're wanting to pray for. Quiet times feel like a chore rather than a delight, but the light of truth is exactly what you and I need. There are many things that we find ourselves believing in the dark that just aren't true. We need the light of God found in His truth. As this psalmist cannot see God, but you notice he believes that God can see him. He, he's fighting to believe that. He can't see, but he knows God can see him. I, one of my favorite things about toddlers is that, and we've done this with all my kids, and um, yeah, I understand you probably do this too, but it, it's amazing to me how a toddler, uh, when they close their eyes, and if you, or they put a blanket over the head, you can say to them, oh, where did you go? Like, what, what in the world? Like, where did you, what happened? You know, I can't see anymore. And then they pull the blanket off their eyes, or they open their eyes, and you just surprisingly go, oh my gosh, there you are. I lost you for a second. You know, that kind of thing. It's just this dumb thing that obviously dads do or something. But, um, and that, that's totally me. But it, but it makes me think, how oh, that's totally me and God. I'm like the toddler for sure, right? Just because I can't see God, I think, man, he can't, he can't see me. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean that he can't see you, not at all. He's fighting, he's fighting, he's real, but he's also hopeful about the process. We see this in verses 5, 11, and 5. I'll read one example. Verse 5, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Guys, it's really important to realize that sorrow is a process. It is not an event. I mean, if you just read the psalm, say you were reading Psalm 42 for the very first time, you had no idea where this was going and you're really into it. You would get to verse 5 and go, oh man, he, gets, he declares his hope in God. He refers to God as his salvation in God. Man, we think he's got it now, right? Like he's turning the corner. Okay, he's coming out of this thing. And then he's, he's fixed, right? Then you get down to verse 9, and you go, well, shoot. He's like, why have you forgotten me? And then you get to verse 11 again. You're like, well, maybe. Maybe we're turning another corner again. Maybe, maybe we're okay now. And then you go to chapter 43, verse 2, and you're like, oh, boy. You know, he's just he's back down in the, in the, in the depths, you know? He's repeating himself. There are common beginnings and middles and endings in the three movements of these songs. If you are walking with someone, you guys, who is despairing, who is melancholy, who is depressed, embrace the reality that sorrow is a process, that sorrow is a process. He's living in this tension. He knows he should be or wants to be somewhere he's not, but he's defaulting towards despair. I mean, three times the psalmist talks to himself asking, why are you downcast, oh my soul? He's talking to himself. He's asking this question, but he follows up that default state of his soul each and every time by defying his sorrow. He says, why are you cast down, oh my soul? And then he defies it. He defies it. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was a, an English pastor and former medical doctor uh, in, the tw- in the 20th century, incredible godly man, incredible preacher. Um, He reflected on this psalm and he said, the psalmist's soul has been crushing him, but he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. You see the psalmist doing it. He's like, self, listen. I will speak to you. Do you notice this? What's he doing? He's making a massive declaration. Listen for a moment, self. I will speak to you. What? Hope in God. He makes war against his sorrow. He says, sorrow, you will not have the last word. 
The clock is ticking. Your time is coming to an end. Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him. Guys, you need to declare to your sorrow, to your depression even, that your days are numbered. Your days are numbered. One day, I will dance on the streets of gold with joy, with fulfillment that just spills over, that my cup will overflow. Why? Because Jesus has crushed my enemy. We, we say to the lying, accusing voice of sorrow, be quiet. You need to pull this car over. Pull this car over. I mean, just now even imagine in your mind the worst driver in the world. Okay, just imagine the worst driver. Maybe you've ridden with that person. If you can't think of it, maybe you are that person. I don't know. And if you are that person, then I don't know if this really applies that well to you. But you've ever been in a car with a really bad driver, it's very uncomfortable, isn't it? You feel out of control. You have no idea how this thing is going to go. And you want to just say to that driver, pull over and let me drive. Right? That's, what this is, this, that's what's happening here. It's saying to your sorrow, pull the car over, but not saying, I'm going to drive. It's saying to your sorrow, God is driving. God is driving. Because we don't just put our hope in a God who can drive well or who's powerful. We have a God who can empathize with us and promise us hope. Why? Because we have a God who has staked his name as the foundation as the guarantee for our hope. As Jesus, the Son of God, had a disturbed soul. The same Greek word that we see here, why are you in turmoil within me? That same word is a word that Jesus used in the Garden of Gethsemane before he died on the cross. Read this with me, Matthew 26. It says, Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane. He said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Notice he's praying in his moment of sorrow. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. As Jesus talks in several places in the Gospels about being in despair, he wrestled with pain in his life. My soul is sorrowful to death, he says. See, guys, sometimes it's not sin that causes our soul to be troubled. You must see that. You might be deeply troubled, numb, depressed, mourning, filled with sorrow this morning even, guys. But Jesus descended into the depths of sorrow. He sunk down into a grave, a dark grave that was not his own. Guys, now your call of grief, your call of grief finds its ultimate echo in Christ's cry from the cross. Because as he hung on the cross, the billows and waves pounded against him and it actually took his life. Do you see this? If you know Jesus, even in your darkest despair, you know that his anguish was far deeper than yours. And his anguish, his sorrow, spares us from our worst anguish, our worst sorrow. And instead, instead, we have a sure promise that one day we will only know day and that we will never know night ever again. Guys, if you know Jesus, our songs of despair, our songs of sorrow are always mixed with a harmony of hope. Always. I love this um, hymn by the Gettys that was written from Psalm 42. It's called, Lord from Sorrow's Deep I Call. Just consider one of their verses. It's a song of sorrow mixed with a harmony of hope. It says, storms within my troubled soul, questions without answers. On my faith these billows roll. God, be now my shelter. Why are you cast down my soul? Hope in him who saves you. When the fires have all grown cold, cause this heart to praise you. And O oh, my soul, put your hope in God. My help, my rock, I will praise him. Sing, O oh, sing, through the raging storm. You're still my God, my salvation. 
Guys, in the end of this psalm, this psalmist's circumstances haven't changed, have they? He's in the process. But his heart is slowly moving from despair to a quiet hope by being real, by fighting, and by looking to the future with hope. I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't help all week but think of, of Charles Spurgeon, who was an incredible preacher in England in the 19th century. And he was crippled with depression and sorrow most all of his life. And at, at 22 years old, at 22, he almost already quit the ministry. He was married for less than a year at that point. He had two infant children, and he was preaching at this music hall for the very first time. And there were about 7,000 people in the crowd, and somebody yelled, fire, fire, the building is collapsing. And everybody started to try to you know, get out of the building and were panicking. And seven people died, and 28 people were severely injured. And this just spiraled Spurgeon into the deepest and darkest places that he had never been in before. And honestly, that continued throughout the rest of his life. But he said this, he said this, I am the subject of depression so fearful that I hope none of you ever get to such extremes of wretchedness as I go. But I always get back again by this. I know that I trust Christ. I have no reliance but in him. And if he falls, I shall fall with him. But if he does not, I shall not. Because he lives, I shall live also, and I spring to my legs again and fight with my depressions of spirit and get the victory through it. And so may you do, and so you must, for there is no other way of escaping from it. Guys, Spurgeon knew Psalm 42 and 43 well. He was in it. He was in it. And we might be there this morning with Spurgeon as well. And so we say with him, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Hope in God. Sorrow, your days are numbered. We we be real with that. We fight and we put our hope in God. Let me send by this. Um, I thought this might be helpful, but just sharing with you one of the exercises I do at my house sometimes in my own quiet times is I, when I'm in places where that cloud is really hanging over me, when there's a lot of despair, even depression, maybe just anxieties, stresses, I'll pray. When I do that, I kind of hold out my hands and I look at my hands and I imagine the things that I'm carrying, whatever that is, the despair, the depression, whatever it is. I look in those hands and I think of maybe cancer that somebody has, someone who's died, the gray cloud, a big decision, whatever it is. And I hold those hands out to God. And I think about 1 Peter 5, 7 that says, cast your cares on God because he cares for you. And I just say, Lord, take this. And I flip my hands over. And then I flip them back. And I I try, I try, I try to envision them empty. Saying, Lord, fill this emptiness now with you. Help me to believe that you care for me. Or do you care for me? And Lord, we we now come to you with, with empty hands this morning. God, many of us maybe find ourselves in Psalm 42 and 43, or maybe we've been there before or one day we will be. And God, I pray that in those moments that you would help us fight, that you would help us to remember that we would preach the good news of who you are to ourselves, that we would see you as a God who sees us even when we can't seem to see you. God, I do pray that you would minister to people who are in those deep and dark places right now, this morning in our church. God, that they would put their hope in you, or they'd be honest with others, God, about where they're at, but ultimately, God, that they would know their hope is secured in you. God, we love you and we're so thankful, God, that we are not people without hope in the midst of our sadness. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we leave you with this, Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. That's my prayer that as people this week, no matter what sort of emotion you're feeling, no matter where your heart is at, that you may abound in hope because the the God of of all people, the God of all creation, the God of you and me, he, He lives in us because of Jesus. May you abound in hope this week.